The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Today we are having a table read, um, which basically means that we're all going to go around and read the scripts where you have them standing um, as of now. Uh, the way it'll work is that, um, say Siri goes first, uh, she would read the script aloud. We would all keep our laptops closed for the first reading, so just listen to her script as it flows. And then the second time she reads it, um, we'll follow along on her script on Annotation Studio and make notes in real time. And then afterwards, we'll talk about um, any feedback that we have for her. And then we'll just go around the class. Um, do you want to say anything before we start? Um, I mean, I think not really. I mean, other than the fact that I'm sure you guys know this, but feedback is best when it's um, very specific. So as we give feedback to each other, and we've been doing this for the most part, is to just really, um, just as much mentioning the things that really work as it does the things that don't work. Because it, I'm sure you all felt, maybe you felt this way when we were workshopping the other day, but as a writer, it's very hard to put yourself out there and have people just give you critical feedback. So if we can also remember to just give some positive critical feedback as well about things that we liked and things that worked, that helps the person in the hot seat feel a little bit better. Yeah, for sure. And um, I also wanted to say, don't be afraid to repeat comments that other people have made, especially on Annotation Studio, if you notice that someone has made the same note that you were going to make, just um, tag a reply to it saying like ditto or something, because um, that'll drop people's attention to a, a space that's worth looking at a little bit more. Um, Andrew had something to say. I just want to make sure I don't lose that. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, just one of the techniques that, that I learned actually from an entrepreneurship class was the technique of doing the yes and as a way of giving like positive feedback where you're sort of riffing a little bit or adding something to what somebody just said. And I think you mm -hmm. guys did that actually in your comments. And that was received very positively because it's like, yes, you get it and yeah, you're yeah. adding more to it. Um, I will say that looking over the scripts that were sent in this weekend, I think everyone's in a really good spot as far as ideas go. Um, like the topics of your videos are actually very, very fascinating, so that's a really good space to be in. Um, I think that the common sort of room for improvement that people have right now is connecting specific examples to the bigger picture. And I think that you get that in your head, but making it a little more explicit in your script is where um, where your focus should be on next. And I tried to give some of that feedback online, and maybe today I can explain some more of the comments if you didn't understand them as well. Um, <clears throat> but connecting sort of uh, the facts that make up a tutorial video into a bigger picture, like this is why you should care, is a very tricky thing to do. But hopefully today, with the feedback of everyone in class, you can have a better sense of how to do it. Um, and I'll also say that at the end of the day, this is your video. And the final decisions are up to you. So um, mm -hmm. it is OK if people offer differing piece, pieces of advice, conflicting opinions. Uh, and a lot of my feedback, I was saying this is a matter of personal taste. I don't really find this necessary in this part. And that's OK. Uh, final decisions are up to you as long as you sort of justify um, why you've made the choices that you have. And uh, don't. I don't want you to feel like you need to come away from this table read with a checklist of things that you need to do. And then um, once you do them, like the script is magically finished. Because uh, that's not going to happen. And unfortunately, that's sort of how a lot of us approach these <laughs> sort of things. At least that's how I first approached them. Um, so it's OK to repeat people. Constructive feedback is good. The yes and thing is a good strategy. Um, and uh, I don't. I don't know if there's anything else. I just thought it might be why. I mean, maybe I'm the only one who doesn't know how to get on this annotation software. Does everyone know how to do that? No? Yes? OK, then maybe I'm the only one who doesn't know how to do this. It was the homework on the first day. Um, oh. There's a link on the Tumblr okay. on the top page. So I was like, we should probably, in order to make this run smoothly, all be ready so that there isn't a big gap in between the first person. All right. Does Here it is, annotation studio. Oh. Hmm. <coughs> 
Oh, this will also be an opportunity to practice hosting. So whenever you're reading the script, it's okay if things aren't memorized completely, but try to deliver it as you would on screen and we'll give you feedback on the hosting as well. So for this first reading, Yulia, just go ahead and read it start to finish. If you um, have cues for like B-roll or something like that, just say, okay, this is the part where I'm gonna have some B-roll. Okay. And should I also describe the animations? Um, yeah, yeah, just like briefly, briefly go over that. Um, so for this first read, everyone just close the computers. If you have to make notes, uh, do it analog. Um, whenever you're ready. What do a cell phone, a river, and a cancer cell have in common? The answer is fractals. Fractals in mathematics are never-ending patterns. Scientists can program these infinite patterns by repeating a simple mathematical process over and over. So if you zoom in, you'll see the shape, the same shape again and again and again. And here I would show an animation of that on a computer. Similarly, a tree grows by repetitive branching. Just like our fractal, a tree extends its branches, one smaller than the other, but similar. A tree can't grow as far and precisely as a truly mathematical fractal, but we can still study nature in terms of fractals. In fact, so many things in nature have these pattern properties, and show animation of all those things, it sometimes feels like the world itself is one giant fractal. Rivers of the planet flow like the blood vessels in our bodies. Lightning bolts become electrifying rivers of the sky. And just look at this honey. Show fractal honey. Here's something even wackier, a brain fractal shaped forest. One way to explain this abundance of patterns is the fact that nature is just great at reusing efficient mechanisms. How and why that happens, we can't really tell. But although the existence of fractals remains a mystery, mathematicians have found a way to study the wacky structures. Clouds are not spheres and bark is not smooth, but with fractal geometry we can mathematically explore them. In the 1970s, a mathematician named Menno Benoit Mandelbrot was hired to investigate noise in telephone lines. Now Mandelbrot loved connecting images with numbers, so he immediately graphed the data he collected. And he came up with this, shell Mandelbrot fractal, um, and also the equation that comes along with it. At first, the image didn't look too special. In fact, it kind of resembled a turtle with a giant head. It wasn't until nighttime that Mandelbrot looked closer. He zoomed in once and found a smaller turtle etched onto the original one, and an even smaller turtle on that one. Mandelbrot kept zooming and zooming, and the turtles kept shrinking and shrinking, but they were still the, all the same shape. Mandelbrot was convinced he'd seen a nightmare, but when the shape remained on the screen the next day, Mandelbrot knew he was onto something huge. A simple equation, applied repeatedly, carried incredible properties. What if, thought he, you could create such expressions for other natural phenomena. And that's exactly what mathematicians do today. Fractal geometry allows them to model, say, mountain ranges, and then use the models to study earthquakes or create realistic special effects for our favorite movies. So you would show animating a mountain range from fractal triangles and then um, a scene from Star Wars where that was used, or other movie. In healthier news, fractals may also help doctors diagnose cancer faster and more accurately. They can study the edges of various cells in our bodies using fractal geometry. Here, the cell on the right is more jagged and repeating than the one on the left, which means it's the more aggressive, faster-growing cancer cell. This way of discovering cancer can be about 10 times more effective than the current methods. So that's how cancer cells and rivers relate. But what about cell phones? They aren't really part of nature. Well, in the 90s, a radio astronomer by the name of Nathan Cohen was having troubles with his landlord. The man wouldn't let him put a radio antenna on the roof. So, Cohen decided to make a more compact fractal radio antenna instead. The landlord didn't notice it, and it worked better than the ones before. Working further, Cohen designed a new version, this time using a shape called the Menger sponge. The fractal's infinite sponginess allowed the antenna to receive multiple different signals. The Menger sponge is not really the sponge you'd be scrubbing your back with, but you can still think of it like that. Imagine both water and soap getting through a sponge's holes, except the water is Wi-Fi and the soap is, say, Bluetooth. 
With Echo and Sponge, your cell phone would have to look something like a giraffe to receive both those signals. Not quite as handy, is it? Fractals are already very common, yet we're still searching for more applications, asking questions, building new patterns, and exploring nature's best, here at MIT and everywhere in the world. Look around you. What beautiful patterns do you see? All right. <clears throat> Can I ask a question before we start? Absolutely. Is the reason why why you have us not having our laptops up so that we don't want to start writing? Or from your perspective, like, just as someone who doesn't process information auditorily, like, mm -hmm. in my ears, that was a really hard activity for me. Yeah. Is it, po is it possible to still accomplish your goal while looking if you don't type? Um, so the reason why George and I don't have people look at the text the first time around is because when you're watching the video, ultimately you're not reading it with the script in front of you. Um, and you'll notice that like there may be moments where you tune out when you don't have a script in front of you following along, which is going to be the experience that a viewer is going to have. Um, and I, I know that that's very difficult to do because we don't have the visuals, which is why we also do it again with the script. But um, the first time is more to just like experience it as close to an experience as the viewer would have of a video. Um, because they're not going to be following along with notes. They're not going to know what's coming next. Um, so whatever confusion you may feel in this first read through is probably more similar to what an actual viewer of the video will feel. That helps me understand that. I can, I can deal with my discomfort now. Okay. <laughs> um, so how about for this next part? Um, let's all go to Annotation Studio and look at the Fractals document. Sorry, my internet's uh, I know, mine's slow too. Slow. I'm here. Would you guys find it more helpful if for the second time through, everyone got to read through the script at their own pace and then offered feedback? Would you rather do it that way? Yeah. Yes? OK. Then how about um, everyone take a look through Yulia's script take a couple minutes to do that. And if you have feedback while you're reading through, go ahead and make notes, and then we'll talk about it afterwards. All right, has everyone gotten a chance to at least read through the whole script? OK. Let's go ahead and talk about it now, just in the interest of time. Um, Yulia, did you want to talk a little bit about some of the edits you were already thinking about making, or some of the things that you're struggling with right now? Um, yeah, so um, um, what um, the instructors have suggested is um, to take out um, some of the stories and examples and focus on one story, which is the one that has to do with the cell phone, because that is an example of taking a mathematical concept and applying it to real life. Um, so that that way I could kind of delete or shorten the Mandelbrot story, but also some of the examples of fractals in nature. Um, I would focus on them less and kind of put them at the end, um, maybe describe them less, but instead explain more what a fractal is and some equations that come along with it, um, which to me is the hardest part because the equations of fractals, even though they are... Um, so the, the equation for Mandelbrot, for example, is z equals z squared plus c. Um, but the z's in there are complex numbers, and you just keep iterating the equation. Um, so even though it could be simple to show what's happening in just a quick animation, kind of plugging in numbers and seeing what happens, um, I cringe at the idea of simplifying it to that, um, because that is not necessarily the accurate representation. So that's why originally I did not include the equation. Um, I kind of wanted to maybe animate just the z equals z squared plus c at some point just to show what it looks like, but let the reader kind of explore that on their own if they wanted to. Um, so I guess right now, the my biggest problem is 
can I and should I include more math in this um, or not? I mean, I don't think it's necessarily about the math. I think that um, the script has a good specific example, and it has a, a really great big picture. Like, the pitch is awesome. I think that's uh, a really great uh, point to work from. It's just that the connecting piece seems a little bit, like, there's not as much connective tissue there. So when I'm reading through this, and I saw Nathan kind of had a similar comment, too, um, I don't quite get how all the specific examples actually relate to that big picture. And for me, personally, it was understanding like what exactly, I, I don't fully understand what a fractal is yet, so I can't make that jump with you to all the applications of fractals. Um, so I understand what you're saying, how the math itself is maybe a little complicated to explain, but um, like I don't understand how a fractal is math, I guess. Does that make sense to other people? I don't know if anyone else felt that same confusion. But it, it was like, I, I get like the turtle thing, and I get it's a repeating thing. Um, but I don't understand how like math describes that. OK. Um, I guess that's an easy fix, because you can just say you can, um, there's an equation that goes along with all of these fractals. So that we can program. I had a similar, like, totally, like, to me, that's the big piece that's, that's missing with this. I mean, that, that, that being said, I mean, let's pause and just take a moment that, like, your big idea at the very beginning was to talk about how math isn't real, right? And this is so amazing. Like, you have come so far, and these stories, I just commented that they, they make it real in this way that when we were first sketching on the board that first day, you were really struggling to figure out what were those anchors that were going to help you talk about that, con that sort of abstract idea. And, and I feel like you really are doing a, a fantastic job at, at grounding this big idea in these, in these stories. That being said, I think you're, this is when being an expert or thinking deeply about a topic is so hard. Be able to, being able to separate and to figure out what the rest of the world does or doesn't know about this thing, right? To you, what is probably very obvious, I'm going to be very honest that I'm not a quantitative person, right? So I'm probably at a sixth grade math level for like this kind of a, you know, of, of a video. And I completely had a gap for me being like, I faintly recall having studied fractals in my early middle school years. I remember that it's a pattern and I remember kind of what it looks like. I have no idea how a mathematician goes from seeing a tree to being able to break that into an equation and how that, like, what that would even look like, or how it would, like, that to me is this, and how that becomes into a fractal. And, and to me, that, that's like a big mystery to me, that I don't want you to explain everything, mm -hmm. because that would probably be really boring, honestly. It's and, and its own video. It's like, mm -hmm. totally. But if there's some way to, on a high level, explain what a mathematician is doing mm -hmm. in there, where, why, why would I study that? Like the, the big questions for me are like, why would I want to study that tree? How would I go about doing it in such a way that it would bring me to some sort of mathematical, like what the, the why and the how is very interesting to me in terms of like <clears throat> what the mathematician is actually doing and why they would do it and then how you would apply that to other things. Okay. So I don't need you to go into the whole equation, mm -hmm. but I need to understand like the process that a mathematician would go through. I don't know if you guys feel similar. Oh, yeah. I was saying with that, like, when I was seeing it the whole time, like, I know it's not, like, uh, fractal geometry or anything like that, but if you were to take, like, you mentioned mountains, and, like, just to describe how they're doing this, like, because they know y equals mx plus b in sixth, seventh grade. I think that's when they start to learn. You just put, like, the slope of, a, you know, this line. This, it's described by this equation, and it describes, you know, this slope of a mountain. That's kind of what it does, just to a lot higher degree. I think that's something that they would understand if they already know the math behind that, and they're just kind of just a little bit more complex. And, uh, one one part that I thought where you could put that in is uh, in scene three. So you just describe fractals as never-ending patterns. So I think there's there's room there where you could kind of go into like there's not even much rearranging you have to do. You could probably just insert something right there. Okay. So the rest of it, though, I, just, like, I, I thought there was really good examples um, that described it, so I thought it was pretty good. Nathan brought up a point that I also had when I read this script the first time about uh, having so many examples. Do you want to explain that further? Um, well, just at the beginning, I felt that 
Um, there are a lot of different examples in a row that were like really cool examples. Um, but all of them, I was like, each one I tried to stop and think like, well, what, like, how is that like a thing? How does that work? But then there's another example, and I just kind of got a bit overloaded. Okay. Um, I think the animation might help with that uh, because like where I talk about rivers, blood vessels, and lightning balls it, and honey, if you look at them like from above, like if you have pictures, they look very, very similar. So the idea is kind of to show the similarity. Um, and I guess I, somebody mentioned that um, like the brain, the brain shaped forest was um, kind of overkill with that. So I can, um, so I can definitely understand that. Um. I think that they're, they're good examples, but the, what might be an issue here is that it's taking too long to get to the bulk of the video. Um, and this is something that George and I were talking about too, that you have really three themes in this video, um, like cancer cells, nature, and cell phone lines. And I, I like how you open it with like, what do all these things have in common? But there's honestly so much to explore in each facet that I'm wondering if you should just really focus on one like you had, had said earlier. Um, just because the thing that I kept thinking about, which is along the lines of Nathan's thinking, and I mentioned it in the <coughs> comments too, but it really reads like a BuzzFeed article almost at the beginning with like all these examples. And I keep thinking about how awesome of an article it would be with like GIFs showing all these different things. But there's not enough of a compelling reason to make a video out of it, right? The whole storyline of, um, what's his name? Nathan Cohen is actually, I thought that was really interesting. I don't know what example you guys thought was the most compelling to listen to or read. What did you guys feel about the, the cancer cells or? Well, from a biologist standpoint, the, um, exactly what your concerns are with like reducing the equations and that, that's what I felt you did in, unintentionally with the cancer cells in that you, you have this really punchy statement like this way of discovering cancer can be about 10 times more effective than the current methods. But coming from a biology background, you cut out so much in explaining like how cancer is detected, um, what, what are the current methods, and comparing it to the fact that the, the edges of the blubbing cells look like fractals in the first place. And so um, for me, this was your weakest example. And I, I enjoyed reading your script and like the other examples. I feel like just because you spent more time explaining them and flushing them out, and you have, I think, from your background, a better understanding of like the Nathan Cohen story. Um, they just sounded like stronger examples. So in my opinion, cut out the cancer, even though it's cool and like cancer is a very hot topic right now in all fields of study. Um, I think people will get more out of your video at a more focused point if you choose fewer stories to tell. And by doing so, you actually allow yourself to be able to allude to the cancer topic, right, without diving into it, right? Like if, yeah. if, you, if you pick the Nathan story for you go more deeply into explaining, you know, more of the more of the, the meat that we're talking about. It doesn't mean that you don't get to mention how fractals could have an impact on cancer, right? It doesn't give you the same depth, but it's easier to apply the concept when you understand something deeply in that way. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I think in general, and again, this is sort of something that I saw with a lot of scripts, it's a lot of breadth and not enough depth. So lots of examples, um, but sort of shallowly sitting on top of them. Um, I think this is an opportunity to really challenge your audience and teach them something really substantive that they're not going to get in school. And you can do that through the example. And I think there's a lot that you can cut out, and again, like we've noted them on the, the annotation so you can see exactly what we're talking about. But if you really rely on showing, not telling, for example, scene nine, where you're describing rivers of the planet, the brain-shaped forest, like you don't even have to say any of those things if you have the images pop up. Like uh, there are lots of pattern, fractal patterns in nature, like in rivers, anatomy, um, the sky, honey, right? Like you've reduced an entire scene down to basically five words there. Um, 
The other thing I wanted to mention, because um, this is sort of a tool that anyone can use, we talk a lot about the reveal, right? So Chris was talking about how you can use the camera to make a reveal. You have a really good setup for a reveal in the first scene, right? What do XYZ have in common? That's pretty much exactly how the plants video was set up. Like, what do all these chemical compounds have in common? They all come from plants, right? And the, the reveal is that all these unfamiliar things come from a familiar thing, right? Here you've got sort of the reverse setup. You have all these familiar things come from an unfamiliar thing. Um, and I don't think a reveal works as well necessarily when you've got that setup because people don't know what a fractal is. Um, and so if you maybe switch scenes three and two, or maybe get rid of scene two and just go straight to scene three, the answer are never ending patterns seen in nature and math called fractals. Do you see it? That's like a subtle nuance, um, but a reveal set up to where you lead with a set of familiar and then you reveal with a punchline of an unfamiliar, it doesn't work as well necessarily um, because the response is gonna be, uh, what? Instead of, oh, whoa, plants, you know. Um, Can I add one thing? Yeah, of course. You know how we talked about, um, we talked about how the math stuff was really complicated? I feel like this, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm way out and I feel about this one, but I feel like as soon as you feel like you're in that zone of being like, oh, I know a lot about this, and hard for me to figure out how to share this with my audience, then to me that's that's where our nugget of truth is with these videos, is figuring out how to share those complicated ideas with the lay audience, right? As soon as you're in that uncomfortable zone of being like, I know a lot about this and it's complicated, that's where the truth is in this, like, that's it. That's our gift that we're offering the world, right? Is having you simplify a complicated idea for the public. So if you're in that discomfort place, like, I feel like we need to live in there. That's like our zone. The way I see it. Uh, uh, oh, go ahead. So would it help if, like, because I feel like I'm very curious about the fact that it would help, like, let's say she, she explained it to me. Because when she said the Z squared thing, I was thinking, I just couldn't stop thinking about it. I was thinking of figuring it out. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, it, yeah. It's up to Julia to figure out what, what style helps her the best, whether talking it out or writing it out or what. What is your tool that's going to help you figure out how to, to get that complicated thing to share? Right? And that, that's each of your challenges to figure out like your own learning style, to figure out how do you go into that challenging place and figure out how to simplify it. And if it's talking it out, then that's great. But maybe it's not for Julia. Julia, sorry. I don't know. I also wanted to use um, your script as an example to talk about it again in a broader, th broader thing that everyone can use, um, which is how you set up things with your intonation. So um, people generally associate emphasizing things with emphasizing your voice. Um, you know, at first, this is scene 12, at first the image didn't look too special. In fact, it kind of resembled a turtle with a giant head, but it wasn't until nighttime that he looked closer and he zoomed in and there was a smaller one and a smaller one and he thought they were all the same shape and he had a nightmare, right? Like that sort of, um, the default way that we try to bring focus onto a natural subject when we're hosting. But you can play a lot with um, emphasizing with a smaller voice, if that makes sense. So instead of saying, he zoomed in on a smaller one and a smaller one and a smaller one, and then he had a nightmare, um, you can emphasize the weirdness by pulling back at an unexpected point. He zoomed in and he saw a smaller one and a smaller one and then a smaller one, right? Those are two different types of deliveries that you can use, um, but don't always, you don't always have to rely on using your volume and sort of the, the brashness of your voice to emphasize certain topics, because it gets a little repetitive over the course of an entire episode. So you can do that for certain sentences, but for others, really, really um, play up the power of actually a quiet volume and an unexpected pullback that also draws attention to does that make sense to people? OK. Um, does that give you enough to work with? Yes. I think it's a really good start. And again, 
let me know if you guys disagree, but I, I think that if you jump into the meat of your episode a little bit earlier, really dive into um, the Nathan Cohen story, you can use the anecdotes to actually explain some of the things instead of having to take whole scenes to, to go over concepts with an analogy that you don't need necessarily. And just so you know, I timed it, and it took you five minutes to read through the script. And I would give yourselves about a minute buffer room on top of however long it takes you to read the script and even describe the scenes. Because with B-roll and with cuts, um, you never, you're going to have a little more time that your video is going to last in addition to the time it takes for you to read the script. All right. Does anyone want to go next? How about the top one on the list? Why do some people handle the cold better than others? So this is David. And did you change this script at all since the last time I saw it? OK. Uh, so what I did was um, I added some more um, like research okay. to make it more, to make it more uh, hopefully more meaty. But I also think that maybe the wording in it is not ideal, because most of it... Wording is definitely the easiest thing to address in editing. Um, so why don't you just go ahead and read this script aloud to us, and if everyone can pull their laptops down. So why do, people handle cold be why do some people handle cold better than others? Why do some people need to wear lots of layers, while others feel fine running shorts? What makes all the difference? Imagine a giant furnace. To generate more heat, we need to burn more coal. Now imagine your body as this giant furnace. Our metabolism is the fire, and sugars, which are broken down, carbohydrates and fats, are the coals. Inside your cells, the sugars are burned by mitochondria to produce heat and ATP, a molecule that stores and releases energy as required by the cell. To generate more heat for warmth, our bodies burn more sugars. This is the first way we deal with coal. The second way we react to coal is that our blood is restricted by the outer okay? our, our blood is, is restricted to the outer organs. The blood circu circulatory system acts like highways to the different organs. Imagine our blood as trucks carrying oxygen and heat to the organs. As the speed of the trucks is higher, more heat falls out and is lost to the surroundings. Hence, our body slows, slows down the flow of blood by tightening the blood vessels. It is the same way, same way as squeezing a lane on the highway. The third way is during more extreme cases of cold. Our body resorts to quick skeletal muscle contractions called shivering in an attempt to create warmth by expanding energy. It turns out that our bodies aren't always equally created. A team of California genetics, led by Dr. Douglas C. Wallace of the University of California, has found that many of the world's people are genetically adapted to the cold because their ancestors lived in northern climates during the Ice Age. Yeah, this is a very big chunk because I actually copied it. The genetic change affects basic body met metabolism. The genetic adaptation is still carried by many northern Europeans, East Asians, and American Indians, most of whose ancestors once lived in Serbia, but is absent from people native to Africa. The genetic change affects the mitochondria, causing it to generate more heat and less chemical energy which was very helpful to early ancestors trying to survive the cold. Other than our genetic makeup affecting how much we can withstand the cold, our physical makeup also plays a part in our resistance to cold. We lose heat to the environment through convection with the air surrounding our bodies. When there is a greater difference in temperature or more surface area exposed, there is a greater heat loss. We can slow down this process by reducing the surface area in contact with the cold surface or by increasing thermal resistance by insulation. In 1877, American biologist Joel Allen showed that the length of one's limbs affected the amount of heat lost to the environment. Bodies with stockier frames and shorter arms mean less surface area exposed to the cold. This also meant that smaller bodies, which have more surface area to volume, lose heat more rapidly. Fat, which acts as an insulin, insulation, helps to increase thermal resistance, making one lose heat at a slower rate. Thus, more people with, thus people with a healthy bulge will be able to withstand the cold. Other than our genetic and physical makeup, there is one more way to resist the cold, meditation. Introducing Wim Hof from the Netherlands. In 2009, he completed a full marathon in temperatures below minus 20 degrees Celsius, dressed in nothing but his shorts. 
Wim Hof is aptly named Iceman for his ability to withstand extreme cold conditions by turning up his term internal thermostat with his mind. Wim Hof practices G thermal meditation that allows his body to produce more heat than the average person. Now, this sounds, this sounds wishy-washy and non-scientific, but a, a team of researchers led by Associate Professor Maria Kozen from the Department of Psychology at NUS, Faculty of Arts and Social Science, for the first, showed for the first time that it is possible for the core body temperature to be controlled by the brain. The scientists found that core body temperature increases can be achieved using certain meditation techniques. A second study was conducted with Western participants who used a breathing technique of the G thermal meditative practice. They, they were able to increase their core body temperature within limits. Now that we understand our genetic and physical makeup and how it affects our resistance to cold, as well as how to combat the cold, maybe if the next ice age were to come, we will better be able to withstand and survive it. Yeah. Thank you. Now, so we'll go look at his script and um, actually maybe this time we can talk more of the feedback and, and you can take notes because Yulia took a little longer than I thought it would, so I just want to leave enough time for everyone. Um, but a quick note, when you guys read your scripts during the table read, read it like you would actually host it. Um, you clocked in at exactly five minutes, but you read a lot faster than you talk normally. Um, and when people read, they often have the exact same intonation structure when they read a sentence, which is to go, this is how I'm reading the sentence. I'm reading it and my tone goes down at the end. I'm reading the next sentence and it's going down at the end. And so every single sentence sounds the same. Does, does that make sense, right? Um, and when you do that, uh, and I know that you were just reading off of the script, but it's a habit that everyone falls into. Uh, when you do that, it makes it very, very evident that you're reading off of a script. When you talk in real life, you have different intonations in your, vo your voice. You go up, you take kind of pauses, um, your voice goes down at the end of some sentences, sometimes it goes up if you're asking a question. Um, but when you're reading verbatim from text, your intonation tends to fall into the habit of having the same intonation structure. So just be mindful of that. And for people who are going next, really try to read your script as you would present it in the video. Um, so that was just a quick note. Now, how about everyone just read through the script? Don't worry about commenting. Um, and then we'll all just sort of do live comment feedback on this one. OK, so I think this script is um, has this similar strength, strengths as Yulia's in that you have a lot of very specific examples. But I think it also struggles with um, having a hodgepodge of anecdotes and not necessarily a real unifying n noticeable theme. Um, my big question about this script is, is your theme more about why some people feel more comfortable in the cold or why some people would survive better in the cold? Because that's a point that Jamie brought up in the last class. The second. Because um, what I don't understand is how these specific examples actually imply better survival in the cold. Because they're all about like, you know, you burn more, more energy to produce more heat, but are some people's genetic makeup actually, you know, do they, does it make them more prone to surviving in the cold or does it just make them more comfortable in the cold? Some people's genetic makeup allows them to burn and create more heat and therefore better survive, which also makes them more comfortable. But that's a factor. But um, the way you open up the video, it kind of implies, you know, why do some people wear a lot of layers while other people can go running. Are, are you implying that the people who go running in shorts could survive being on the cold longer? Is I I'm not implying that they are able to do that because, maybe because of the reasons people, like maybe they have uh, genetic makeup predisposed to, to better withstand the cold. Yeah. Or maybe they have a physical makeup that is, that is just better and helps them to But is that scientifically proven? Yeah. Based on the, that's why the, I cited the, I the, the documents, the scientific studies. Because that, to me, I don't know how you guys feel, but to me, that's actually not established with the facts that you've given. Um, 
Like if you took the person who was wearing shorts running and the person who was wearing a coat and you stuck them in Antarctica, would the person who was wearing shorts live longer? I mean, the person who was wearing shorts wouldn't complain as soon, right? Like the person who wears, who bundles up, they'd, they'd complain about being cold, but would they necessarily die first? Yeah, I mean, of course, while you were talking, I put on my jacket. <laughs> I was thinking about. I thought, that, like, I, I have seen stuff, I, I mean, and I know whatever I've seen, there's probably many things out there to be native, but if people are in, like, hypothermic conditions, and this kind of leads to the, the like metaphysical, I guess, like that aspect you talked about with the marathon runner. Um, some people are able to like make their core temperature warmer okay. than it would be in just like ambient temperature right. if they're actually in like a colder environment. So I have seen stuff like that. What I thought would be cool with with that piece though is if at the beginning you say why do some people handle the cold better than others? But like. It's all these questions, but if you introduced with like, you know, in 2009, whoever ran this marathon and was wearing shorts, like, how's he able to do that? And yeah. That, that way I think you're, you know, you're taking out that first chunk <coughs> and you're replacing it with this, which you already have in there, so you're shortening it a little bit, and I think it's more of an interesting uh, introduction. Because that's, that's the stuff that I, I thought was really interesting, is like, how, how are people able to do this, like, and scientists study them, and Whatever. Yeah, I actually I agree. I think it's a much more compelling opening than um, why do some people wear shorts outside? So basically, moving scene three C to the beginning. Um, I, I think go ahead. Um, the the way that the scene three C is currently placed, it almost seems like an odd one out because it talks about meditation. Yeah. Um, so if you did start with it, that would be really cool. But also maybe even placing the word meditation with, oh, you're controlling something with your brain, just so it seems more like a scientifically related concept. Um, and then also um, another thing is um, you name a lot of scientists and dates. Um, so if maybe you could talk about those experiments but not mean people or locations. Um, that might make it easier because then you don't have to think about California and Northern Europe in the same sentence that mean different things. Um, I actually think it's more of the second scene. Um, I feel like the second scene is kind of explaining on like a like more like cellular level and like anatomical level how we stay warm. and. It doesn't really connect too well to either the intro or the third scene. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's actually really interesting, but right now it's kind of like, it doesn't really say, like talk about why some people do any of these better than others. And then there's only like one part in the third scene where the mitochondria is mentioned. Um, so I think that just needs to be a little bit better connected to everything else. How vital is scene two? Is he, is he I? But my talk was how it's going to go is like introduction and then how our body handles and what is the difference between yeah. people. It's a very classic five paragraph essay form, right? Intro, background knowledge, um, question, example, right? Um, which is a very logical flow of ideas, which is why so many people write essays that way. Um, but I think it's also why it's reading a little bit like a news story right now. Um, it's reading a little bit like um, like a part of a, a textbook almost, right? And it really, the stuff at the end um, is really the more interesting part to me at least, the, the reason why maybe it, w it should be a video over an article. And I think uh, PJ's idea of moving the example from the guy from Iceland as your opening will help with that. Um, and I also agree with Nathan that you may not even need most of scene two, right? Because the point of the video isn't to explain how we stay warm. The point of the video is to explain why some people are more predisposed to handling like incredibly harsh environments than others. Like I think the concept of hypothermia is 
fascinating, but that word isn't mentioned at all in this video. And let me know if you guys disagree, because this is a totally a personal taste thing, but I feel like that would be a much more compelling example to use than to say, you know, you stay warm by shivering and you stay warm by your blood vessels contracting. Like those are all very true facts that don't take away necessarily from understanding how people are more predisposed. It's just that you spend such a long amount of time on that and it takes a while to get to the bulk of your video. It's like the same thing that was happening with Yulia's. Um, and it's very counterintuitive because it's very different from typical science communication things like that's not how you write a journal article. <coughs> With a journal article, you spend like five pages with an intro and setup. Um, but with the video, I, I kind of don't think you need the second scene. I think you need bits and pieces from it to explain, explain the point. But what do you guys think? I think maybe to just like identify uh, the second scene. Like, so it's on a cellular level, and then uh, shiver, and so it's on like. Skeletal, maybe just identifying it, but not really expounding on it by the year. Jamie, were you going to say something? Yeah, I'm just processing that um, this is when, by going deep, it allows you to go shallow as well, right? Like with Julia, with the diving deeply can allude to something else. I, I, I'm, I'm with you now about it's if we dive in, if we start with the idea of this runner who was able to this mind, right? Through telling that story, you can actually tell me about what's happening on a cellular level and how he was able to feed it, right? I think, so one thing that I think needs to be said somewhere in this is the idea that if you can strip away some of the variables like what people ate or like, I don't know, like as someone who used to be a serious hiker, if someone has to go to the bathroom versus doesn't, that actually makes a really big difference on staying warm. Because I mean, if you think about it, right, like if you have all this liquid in your in your in your you know that you need to go to the bathroom, your body's warming all that up. And if you just went to the bathroom, you'd suddenly get a lot warmer, right? So straight, taking those variables out, say like all things being the same, with these two fundamental bodies, right? What's going on on a cellular level? That helps you understand the mind the mind breaking, the cool, like, um, extreme example we have of this guy beating the system somehow. But in order to understand how cool it is that he's broken and beat the system, you kind of need to understand what the norm is for the system. So by using him as your freak example, it allows you to also tell the story of how things should work in a normal, you know what I mean? Do you see what I'm saying? And then suddenly, his story becomes your streamline the forward motion throughout your your um, your video, and the backwards telling of the story is uh, of the facts about how a person breaks down, you know, glucose or whatever, ends up being part of that forward motion because you're trying to explain this cool, weird, freak thing of someone can actually use their mind to change or at least appear to feel, change their temperature. So I really like this like, this reframing. Yeah. I think it allows you to go deeper and to make it more interesting by doing less. I think you also need to bring the point of the video earlier on. Because um, right now, it's at, it comes in scene four at the very end. Um, maybe if the ice age were to come, we would better be able to withstand and survive it. it it's really random right now, right? Because you haven't really set that up as an argument. So. I would say put that at the beginning too. Like, there was this guy a long time ago, and he um, he ran this marathon half naked. Like, why didn't he die? Like, what you know? Is there something about him that is you know? Gen I don't don't say genetically superior because that'll that's very NPC. But you know, like, are there genetic traits about him that would equip him to not only withstand you know cold temperatures, but maybe survive? the next ice age. Is there something about him, about humans like him, that are different from other people, right? That's what I'm saying about it needs to get into the meat and the bulk of the video sooner. Because right now, it's a lot of intro, intro, intro. And um, the example doesn't even come until scene 3C, which is over halfway through the video. 
Does that make sense to people, what Jamie just said about using a specific an anecdote to describe a lot of the, the core concepts instead of just describing the core concepts separately? Does that make sense? So you can have a lot of fun with that as you being your main story. You can, like, imagine you running half naked across you know, the, the, the football field with obvious snow out, right? That's a really fun intro. Right? I mean, there, there are really fun things you can do that also make it concrete, because you, you, you've done all the hard work already, which was coming up with the science behind it, right? You've already made it into a really concrete story. Here are three specific things that might be happening, right? You just need, you just need a, a hook and a storyline to help you tell that. The application is what's going to differentiate it from a textbook as well. Because right, right now, like, scene, scene two is a textbook move to video. <laughs> And that's fine, but it's not going to be as interesting, I think, as all your, as the anecdotes. I mean, I had the concern that this, this, uh, what's his name? Cold man, ice man. I had a concern that it wasn't scientific enough or robust. But since you added the stuff about the research from NUS, I, I do think that that's interesting. Expand on that more and cut out stuff from scene two to give you time to do that. So I would say, Mo open with Iceman, um, open with the big picture question, are there genetic, what, like what are the fundamental qualities about him that differentiate him from other humans like me? Um, then you can talk about like what exactly happens when people die of the cold, essentially. Like why, why is that happening? It's because your body can't keep up with burning enough fuel, right? So you're talking about the whole furnace concept in that reason, but you're not taking the time to separately ex explain it to people. Um, and then go, so you have the example, you have the huge question, you go into the details of explaining the core concepts, then go back out to the research question again. Does that make sense? I think the really critical part of what Elizabeth just said that is not in your video right now is explaining what happens when people die of um, because that'll really drive home your big question, how will we survive the next ice age? Yes. Yeah. How people die in the cold in the first place. So like, when, what happens when these systems that generate heat fail? And what about them fails? Um, and this may be, this may be like, like too much, so as author, totally feel free to ignore this next idea. But at the very beginning, you talk about putting clothes on as a way of combating that cycle, right? What are the ways that we, and I don't want you to dive deeply into this, but it might be a nice beginning of a wrap up. What are the ways that we can fight the cold given our current cellular structure? So I'm born this way, right? This is me in the world. What, what can I do right now to fight the cold? Like obviously I can put another jacket, right? What's my jacket doing fundamentally? And you talk about that right now in scene two, but do you see that makes much more sense in the context of Jamie's example. So you don't have to take the time to say, let me define shivering, let me define blood constriction, let me define um, meta er, metabolysis, right? Don't take the time to define those things separately from a context. Just seamlessly integrate that into the examples you're already talking about. Or would eating a big spoon of peanut butter would help me. You know, like, like I would want to probably know some concrete things at the end as you're wrapping up along with the scientific of just, I mean, as someone who used to do some pretty extreme outdoor stuff, like, I know that eating a spoonful of peanut butter actually will help, right? But why? Right? And just bring it back on that very concrete level to your, to your audience to be like, because the carbohydrates here. So next time you're about to, you know, stand out and watch a football game in the cold, like, here's a, eat, eat a huge bar of chocolate because, or, you know, put on that extra layer or something concrete and, and not a lot of time, don't waste a lot of time, but that might tie it back to the concrete for your, for your audience a little bit. I wouldn't end it that way though because that's like, it's a little too simplistic for what you could do. Um, so tie it, end it by tying it back to the big question yes. for sure. And that's what I meant when I said in your comments, like what type of research is going on? Because there must be people, there must be people out there who are studying ways to sort of trick our bodies against the way we're naturally hardwired, right? Beyond just like putting on another jacket. So if you can talk about those things, I mean, that's another opportunity to differentiate it from a traditional textbook content. So right now, the way your script is structured is simple question, facts, background facts, 
a bunch of research questions and then really big question, right? And that's like a very standard five paragraph <laughs> sort of format. I would say restructure it so that you open with one of the anecdotes, Iceman, open with the big question, go into the details in the context of the example, then go back out to the research question. Then you can do what Jamie says, which is like, well, you know, if some people like Iceman just are better off, like, what about for the rest of us? Like, what are researchers doing? Or what can we practically do to sort of um, trick nature? And then point it back to the big question again. Does that make sense? Might be worth it, too. Uh, like, the hibernation's like a, I think, a hot topic right now with all the space travel and stuff that they're oh, thinking of. So that's like, I mean, that's addressing eating a lot, low metabolic rate, and it kind of, I think, gets all of that. Why so. are we doing like everything like this? Cool. But also, yeah. like, they're doing that for space research, too, right? Yeah. 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 Very cool. There are a lot of resources at your disposal, so you can talk about things that have never been talked about before. Right, that's the whole point of these videos. That's why. Um, that's what I mean by don't leave them as instructional tutorial videos, because anyone can make those, right? But we have, you know, current research at our disposal. There are so many things that we can talk about that just haven't been talked about yet. So I really want you to spend the m most of the time of your videos on that. Can you might be able to find. I mean, I have no idea if it does this on campus, but I bet we could probably use some research to figure out. Like, is anyone in like Dila? I don't know, like someone, there might be someone on campus that you could talk to who's doing some research on this thing, and we could, we could dive a little into that. It'd be cool. That was a cryogenic, so I think they're going to some stuff. Yeah. What's the pacing that you're planning for this? Just so pacing that, for, for today? For, yeah. Like, how many people are we hoping to get? Um, I was going to try to get as many people as we could. Tomorrow I'm going to do my last lecture to give you guys more time to work on your video than we had originally planned. Um, yeah, so just as many as we can get through today. Whatever we don't finish, we'll do tomorrow. I'll give people a chance to break soon. Yep, absolutely. Let's do one more and then take a break. Um, David, do you have any questions about that, about all of our feedback? So like for example, one section that I think could be condensed to a single sentence, like uh, 3A. So you have this really big paragraph, it's, it's like a paragraph in your essay, you have a citation and everything. But that section can just be reduced to some people uh, have different mitochondria which generates more heat and less chemical energy. Like, that's it. That that was the essence of section three A. I didn't even say. I didn't like show like evidence for it. <coughs> you are you want you you are a reliable narrator inherently in your video. So this is a, a citation to something. Is something you can include in the video description below. And a, oftentimes, a lot of educational channels do. It's like if you want to do further reading on this, you can include it in the description. But if you say a statement like that, that so because of genetics, because of the hardwiring of our DNA, some people's mitochondria is more efficient in this way, less efficient in this way. They have, they're accepting this. And I think because you're a scientist and because you're making this at MIT, that adds to your reliability. And the fact that for your more dubious claims, which in my opinion are the meditation stuff, because psychology is inherently a more dubious field, like anything with the people's brains, like you have a very, very loose understanding of brains. Um, because that's where, if any citations go in your video, that's where you should start referencing researchers, because that's where people are going to go, hmm, this kind of sounds like pseudoscience. But people have heard of mitochondria, people know what mitochondria do, and so if you make a claim that some people's mitochondria, not everyone's, acts differently, then that's an acceptable fact. David, I know this is not what you want to hear, but what I actually recommend you do is write a script from scratch. Write, the, write your next draft. Um, 
because you have all this knowledge in your mind already, so it's not like you need to look at it to rewrite it, but approach it from this completely fresh new structure of opening with an anecdote, connecting that to the big question, explain the anecdote, and in the process of explaining it, you can hit the definitions of why people, or how your body shivers, or how maybe Iceman, um, when he meditated, maybe his blood vessels constricted. I'm totally making this up. You have to fact check all of this. Um, then go back out to, you know, how this could affect our survival rate in the ice age. If you approach it from, because this is going to take a completely different structuring, right? So I almost don't want you to even look at this when you try your next draft, because you're going to have the habit of thinking about it in the same five paragraph structure that you did before. Um, Send the next draft that way. Um, I think in the process, you will end up not including things just naturally. Um, but if you try to look at this draft and say, what do I need to take out? What do I need to put in? What do I need to move around? Um, I think it might be a little confusing to you. Does that make sense? All right. Um, and I will stick around after class today if people want to talk more about their scripts, but I wanted to give everyone a chance to read it out loud to people. Oh, when you are reading, also, this is a tendency that a lot of people have, and I just noticed it because you read last, um, but carry your words through. Uh, you're going to want to talk a little bit slower than you usually do naturally, and you don't want to drop the ends of words off like this, right? Because the effect that that has is you sound robotic on camera, and it's really hard to understand the ends of words, right? So that's a tip for everyone. Just make sure that you carry all of your words out to the end of the sentence. All right, let's do one more and then take a break. How's everyone? I think we might have, I mean, I personally feel like I have You want to take a break right now? Are people in that place? Yeah. All right, let's do a five minute break and then yeah. come back. And I need to make a quick phone call, so I'm going to be like coming back in. Okay, that's fine. Okay. My bladder's going to burst, and I feel like other people might be in the same place. Go for it. Okay. All right. Nathan, take it away. And remember, read it like you would actually try to host it. Why does food in your fridge start to smell, and where does that icky black liquid come from? Wouldn't life just be easier if we didn't have to worry about that? Well, to answer these questions, let's talk about decomposition. Wikipedia says that decomposition <coughs> is the process by which organic substances are broken down into a much simpler form of matter. Well, what does that mean? Basically, in your fridge, on a forest floor, almost everywhere, there are fungi and bacteria that survive entirely by eating dead things. These dead things that make up food can be more or less divided into three categories. Carbohydrates, which are like things like sugars and starches. Lipids, think fats and proteins, like meat. All these are chemically different compounds, so they each get digested in a different way. Enzymes like amylases, which deals with starches and, cellul and cellulases, which deal with cellulose, main component of plants, create sugar from complex carbohydrates, which cells can easily get energy from. Lipids, lipases split lipids into two parts, glycerol and fatty acids, both of which can produce energy. Lastly, proteases break protein into the amino acids that they're made of which both releases energy and provides the bacteria fun and fungi with crucial building blocks. So how, does a yeah. so how does a perfectly nice broccoli floret start giving off this foul black liquid? Well, fruits and vegetables are almost entirely water, so on the most basic level, you could say a plant cell is an extremely complex water balloon. The elastic outside is the cellular cell wall, and the water inside is the intracellular fluid. When a bacteria or fungi uses cellulases to break down the exterior of a cell, it's like if I were to pop the balloon. The liquid and other materials that come out are what cause the muck you see in your fridge. And so what about that smell? It depends on the food type. Basically, if a meat starts to get rancid and smell bad, it's because when lipases break down the fat in the meat, a lot of the fatty acids you end up with aren't too pleasant. If it's a fruit or vegetable, a lot of the time the smell happens after that icky liquid forms. Other bacteria that weren't involved in the initial breakdown move in and start to stink everything up. So looking at this all, wouldn't it be easy if we didn't have to deal with decomposition, if things just lasted forever? Well, maybe, but probably not. The USDA has found that the average American household wastes about 25% of its food, and a lot of restaurants are even worse. 
Sure, that number could go down if there is no decomposition, but other factors can affect how good a food is too, like moisture and exposure to air. And if we didn't have decomposition, what would happen to all that food we throw away? Food items and landfills are dealt with by decomposers and allow the nutrients in food to return to the soil and eventually other living things. If things just sat idle in landfills, we'd end up with a crisis on our hands eventually. Aside from just food, bacteria, fungi, and protists are responsible for breaking down other dead things, like trees. In fact, they're more or less the only things that can do it. So while your house would never have to worry about termites who rely on protists in their stomachs, forests would pretty soon be flooded with dead stuff. So decomposition, while maybe it might, may be annoying when you can't eat that now fuzzy peach in your fridge, is essential to the continuation of our world as you know it. And it's pretty darn interesting too. Just so you know, that was also exactly five minutes. Um, but keep in mind, the pacing of your reading is a lot faster when you're reading off of a script. Um, and then you got to account for all the B-roll that you're going to put in there. So it's clocking in a, a little bit over five minutes. Um, for this one, let's just let's look at the script all together. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and make my first point in the interest of time, if I can find my cursor, which is that this script has the same issue that I was talking about with David, which is that I think the coolest part about your episode is this whole part right here, these two paragraphs. What would happen if we didn't have decomposition and why it's actually super vital, right? But it doesn't come until you've gotten through all this stuff. And I wonder how much of this stuff you actually need, right? Like this whole sentence, and actually this one, I think you could take out completely. Um, go from, why does the food in your fridge start to smell? Wouldn't life be easier if we didn't have that to worry about? Um, you could just say, well, in your fridge, or on a forest floor, uh, there are fungi and bacteria that survive entirely by eating dead things. And they're responsible for turning your broccoli into black mold, right? Um, this stuff is informative. I don't think anyone here suffers from the inability to be informative, right? This is all very uh, factual, but I personally don't care about it as much as, as the stuff at the end. How do you guys feel? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's okay to use technical terminology, but I think this gets a little too jargony to the point where um, people are going to have a hard time understanding why they need to know what a protease is. This is what I meant by David's structure, right? Like, we're so used to writing stuff in this form, where you have the question, right? Then you have the background. Um, then you usually go into an example or an anecdote. Um, and then you have some sort of like, you have a conclusion where you say, your conclusion is So that's why decomposition is important, right? In a video, this is your money shot, usually. This is the thing that looks cool. Have you guys ever seen that? Um, it's a commercial for Sprint, where they have the people like cutting their bills in half. Have you guys ever seen that before? It, I find that a very weird commercial, because it takes them such a long time to get, they like interview people about how much they're spending on their monthly wireless bill, right? It's not until halfway to the, through the commercial that you get to the part where they're actually cutting all their bills in half. And I'm like, if they just open the commercial with those shots, then they could go into the interview stuff. 
But they, whoever produced that commercial was like, no, 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 we have to establish that people hate their current cell phone plan and we have to get them to talk about who they are before we can show that stuff. That's not true of video. You can start with the example. You can start with the big question, right? And instead of having a conclusion, you can have a connecting. Instead of this conclusion, oftentimes you revisit the question instead, right? So I think you should move your example up. Um, you should move it up like right after the question. And in, in David's case, I think you should actually do the example and then the question. You should talk about Iceman and then say, what is it about human certain people that give them the advantage, right? For you, I think you should say, um, why does food in your fridge start to, to smell? Right, because it's like a nice familiar intro into the topic. But then I think you, boom, go into um, what would happen if we didn't have decomposition. And that's like, that's not exactly an example, but do you see what I mean by just diving straight into the meat and the bulk of your video? Were you going to say something, Andrea? Well, I just remember when you did your one line or two line summary, which was yeah. so amazingly awesome. Yeah, yeah. And I'd love to see that in the script of, you know, well, it turns out there are lots of other things that like to eat your food, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the hook. Yeah. No, I think, like, that is where the video exists. I, I don't think you actually need most of this stuff, which, again, I know it was, like, super disheartening to, for people to hear that, like, the majority of what you wrote isn't actually necessary. But I think that in the act of writing this, you've discovered, like, what the really compelling part of your script and your content is, which is this? I'd say the big problem is that, for me, it's accepting that is that in the end, what I really want to make a video about is how it happens, because that's the part that I look at. And there's it, when I want to figure that out on YouTube, there's nothing that told me how it happens. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. That's the problem for me, because that's sure. kind of more. I guess that that's the issue, is that it's not as compelling what I want to make a video as what is probably a better video is what I'm not as interested in as myself. Then I think, I think simply by moving these two paragraphs basically to the beginning, prefacing all this stuff, you can have the best of both worlds. And I actually think that you're right. You do want to explain what's happening, because uh, that's like substantive science that people can be learning about. So. This is a really compelling hook. You know, what if we just didn't have the thing that seemingly inconveniences us? What if things could just last indefinitely? Um, is this crisis unrelated to all the stuff with the enzymes that you were talking about earlier in your script? Um, I think the crisis is more the, I tried the very, in a couple of like, it's like nutrient cycling and nitrogen are very complex topics. So I basically oh, okay. tried to then like very succinctly yeah. like sum it up that basically you need to have things returning. Then what if you just simply say like you need to have things returning to the oil or soil just like you have in the sentence? And then you could say, so what helps, what averts this crisis basically? And then you can go into this stuff that you have um, bacteria that break down the outside walls of plants um, and all the, you know, the liquid comes out and that's like the muck, that's what rot is basically. Um, but in doing so, hone, hone, drive home the point that this stuff is important and desired. So, you set it up with, well, what would happen if we didn't have decomposition? You wouldn't have stuff returning to the soil. You'd have like just endless material piling up on each other. So what averts this crisis? Well, bacteria do this. Um, and by allowing it to rot and allowing things to go back to the soil, you know, go back to the question of like, that's why stuff rots in the first place. So actually, maybe it just needs like a little bit of restructuring more than anything. What do you think, Yulia? Um, I really enjoy your form, informal language, so saying things like pretty darn interesting. 
Um, so I think also if you can maybe put the science jargon into that sort of informal language, um, that would make it more fun. Because that's kind of how you talk. And so if you can't explain it that way, that'd be great. But also you can add images. So for example, when you're saying, how does a perfectly nice broccoli fluid start giving off this foul black liquid? You could show this black liquid instead yeah. of mentioning it or describing it and just say, you know, how does it end up like this? this, this, this. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. It'll save you a lot of time too. Um, I actually don't think you need this sentence personally uh, because by then you've established that is it, that it is interesting and you sort of highlight it through your tone. Um, and in general, again, it's totally a personal taste thing, but I try to avoid observations that a viewer could come to on their own or ones that I could um, say quickly in passing in the context of a sentence. Um, I rarely try to have an observation like that merit its own sentence or its own thought. Do you want to touch the concept of recycling at all? Um, the idea that some, some things that may seem like waste or dead stuff is actually really useful to other things. I, I don't want to complicate this, right? But I, I actually don't know what you mean by that. Like, for instance, mushrooms are decomposers, right? They Their job is to help speed up the cycle, right? And um, like there are other creatures and uh, microorganisms out there that have an important role in like this part of the material cycle that I'm not sure whether it's worth mentioning that that ooze and that gross stuff is actually someone's like delicacy. I think that's what you're trying to get at with the whole like having the nitrates and everything return to the soil. And maybe that's something that you can hit in just a sentence like it goes back, let's see, it allows nutrients in the food to return to the soil. Um, that's vital to the organisms that live in that environment. Yeah, and maybe this is one where maybe having like a visual of the food chain cycle, like that whole really hammers this down visually for people while you're talking as, you know, the sun creates, you know, like just, just a visual map of just the food chain cycle starting from the sun and going back to, and maybe that's all you need with this to hone that sort of biological concept down for people that like life cycle coming off of what you were saying a little bit earlier um so right now the part where you discuss enzymes sounds a lot like the videos i'm making right now for mitx and that there it's like super factual and really concise which is good for those kind of videos. For these kind of videos, um, I feel like you need to integrate this information in the greater structure of the story, like we were talking about. So jumping off of what Andrea, Andrea, you know, um, was saying earlier, um, if you structure it as, we are not the only people who eat our food. Bacteria and protists and things like that also eat our food they use enzymes like proteases to break the protein in our food to do this, as opposed to introducing them as a list, like these are different enzymes. If you can figure out a way where the outer story is, they also are eating our food and breaking it down, and then bringing up these enzymes when it's necessary to define them, instead of just giving blanket definitions of all of them at the beginning, it helps keep the viewer engaged because then they're getting, they're still getting the same amount of information overall, but they're getting it in smaller doses and when the information is relevant. So they're more likely to remember it later on because they'll see like a picture of the meat and be like, oh, the bacteria uses um, proteases to break the proteins down in the meat because they use those as amino acids for themselves or something like that, as opposed to giving the system. That's a really good tip for everyone. I think, Yulia, that's definitely relevant in your script. David, for sure. 
Um, if you, maybe a litmus test is if you find yourself with an entire sentence or an entire paragraph that is just a definition on its own, really think, rethink how that's being done, right? Because um, enzymes like amylases, which deal with starches, uh, create sugar from complex carbohydrates, which cells can easily get energy from, right? Like that's a textbook definition of what enzymes and amylases do. Um, and you can explain that stuff in your examples of, well, it turns out we're not the only things that eat our food. Um, bacteria do that too. Um, I don't think it's like super accurate to say that enzymes eat our food, but you know what I mean? Like, never leave an island of a definition out on its own, I guess, right? Like, don't have just this random, uh, don't leave random islands of facts just, <laughs> just hanging out in the middle of your script um, it, for the purposes of this video. I think this is an important idea. I think you can integrate it in the context of an example, though. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to other people? Yeah, what were you going to say, Joshua? Yes. Uh, um, the, just to, to question, because I had a question in my mind that mm -hmm. the topic of smell wasn't really addressed. Oh, uh, oh, where is that here? Yeah, right now you set up sight and smell as two sort of unrelated things. But I think you don't have to separate the smell out. You can say, you know, when the bacteria break down the interior or exterior of the cell and the crap oozes out of it, um, it also is leaking out um, chemicals that cause rancid smells, right? So you don't necessarily have to differentiate that as a separate topic. Yeah. One more thing, again, it's a personal thing, but I just think the word rot is a lot more visceral and a lot more um, familiar to people. So I, I know that you talk a lot about decomposition, but maybe if you open it with why do things rot in the first place, like what would happen if things didn't. Um, that might be a little bit more welcoming to viewers. Any final thoughts about this one? Again, I think in general, people are in really good shape with their ideas and the concepts and the topics of their scripts. It's really a matter of restructuring it, escaping away from the traditional five paragraph structure and really hitting into the money shots right, right away. That's gonna help your video the most. Andrea, would you mind reading next? <clears throat> Everyone gets to hear my nice bronchitis voice. <laughs> I'm going to mime through most of this, too. Mmm, delicious. Eating foods is one of the great pleasures of life. And to enjoy foods from apples to candy bars, we rely on one part of our bodies, our teeth. Teeth are the hardest substances in our bodies. Little animation, holding a tooth. Harder than our bones and even harder than iron or steel. While we chew, our teeth actually experience forces up to 225 pounds. That's like having a mountain goat jump up and down on our teeth hundreds of times each day. Little animation of a mountain goat. <clears throat> so why doesn't our jaw just crumble under all of those forces? Explanation graphic. Between your tooth so and your... Between your tooth and your jawbone, there is a specialized piece of tissue called the periodontal ligament, or PDL for short. The PDL can easily absorb the normal forces that a tooth experiences while we chew, say, an apple, cushioning or protecting our jawbone from our teeth. And inside the PDL, there are all different kinds of cells. One type, called mechanoreceptors, sense forces of movement or pressure applied to the tooth. 
If the force is large enough, such as biting into an apple seed, these receptors tell your brain to stop biting down. You know, the little crap. But what if we want to force teeth in a certain direction, like with braces? As the braces pull on the tooth, the PDL is squeezed in one direction and stretched in the other, kind of like a rubber band. And here's where it gets really interesting. To make room for the PDL, cells called osteoclasts come in and dissolve a little bit of the bone in your jaw. Another type of cell called an osteoblast comes in and then builds up the jawbone so the PDL cushion can get back to its proper shape holding the tooth in its new position. Cut to image of entire body with the skeleton highlighted. Your jaw isn't the only place where these osteoclasts and osteoblasts alter your bone structure. In fact, this bony remodeling process is happening throughout your body all the time. When braces use, where braces use osteoblasts to physically move things around that are already in our bodies, what if we try to use them to replace things in our bodies? like implants. Implants are kind of like spare parts for our bodies. And MIT engineers are using the properties of osteoblasts and osteoclasts that are already in our bodies to create a chemical coating for these implants. Just like in a mouth with braces, this osteoblast coating will create natural bone to help lock the implant in place. And this is a new section. <coughs> Right now, implants are designed to have the same functionality as the body parts they are replacing. But in the future, scientists could make implants that work better than the original body parts, using bone remodeling to make us lighter, stronger, and faster. And then at, at a certain point, like at the end, I'm actually wearing this weird cyber thing over my eye. That's the end. So you're clocking in at about four minutes, which is it's good. Um, and I thought the delivery w was also really nice too. Really nice. Yeah. I like I got so much more out of it than reading it, which is funny because I don't usually <laughs> like process <laughs> things that way. Those are complaining the beginning. Yeah, class. but like but like the way that you did it was so slow and dramatic. Like the way that you emphasized it was it was helping me process it. it was really good. I like the way that you emphasize the word same. A lot of people would do, it's the same thing, right? They would just sort of accent the word same. But you sort of linger on it. It's the same thing, right? And I, I actually really like that. I think it's a, li a delivery that is not necessarily as intuitive to a lot of people, but it works really nicely in, in that context. Um, all right. So this has changed quite a bit from your original idea, uh, which was first on how braces work to um, more about bone remodeling and rebuilding. Does anyone have comments off the bat about the script? Yeah, Yulia. Um, I really enjoyed it, um, especially like at the beginning when you're talking about, oh, our teeth are stronger than steel. Um, and you kind of demanding attention. And also when you mention, oh, you know, this is where it gets interesting, so I kind of, oh, I should listen to this, is the reaction. Um, the only thing I kind of wanted to learn more about was, you know, how can, you know, we withstand the mountain goat on our teeth. Um, that was something very, it had a large wow factor. Um, and to me that was like, oh, how, how does that actually happen? That's the only thing I wanted to know more about. But other than that, I enjoyed the information. And it made a lot of sense because it wasn't very like scientific, as in like didn't have a lot of jargon. It did get great feedback from Elizabeth and Sarah and Jamie and George. So I think the crumbled crumbling job is in this well, I, I agree that you did a really nice job. You don't start with a money shot necessarily. Um, like you don't start with the big qu picture question, but I think it works in this script because she has so many shareable facts off the beginning. Um, and it's not a traditional five paragraph setup where she talks a lot about defining what the PDL was, which is kind of what your earlier iteration of the script did. Um, 
But I think this is a great example of not necessarily defining every single fact that you need to know about dentistry to get to the point. Um, I want to follow along because you're setting up sort of, it's sort of establishing characters, right? Like the PDL is a character in this story. And what all of these shareable facts do is that it creates the persona of the PDL as being something really strong and something really you know, robust. And the fact that we're now, as humans, going to try to manipulate that, it um, establishes the challenge in that, which I think is a really nice thing that it does. Um, this section is not as related to it, but I think the video is short enough to where you can include it, because it's just kind of a cool fact. Do you guys find that? distracting or do you think it's okay to leave in there? In the camera receptors? Yeah. I have a different question to go with that. Or a different so I don't I don't I, there's something that's kind of missing to me at the end, which is the mm -hmm. four minute question. I don't know that this is actually a four minute one because if you add on my comment it might add some go to the end. I feel like the end ends like kind of abruptly for yeah. me. And so I think we can get back to your question once we know where we're ending. But part of me wants, you ask some really good questions at the very end about like, we're, what if we manipulate the body to be better, stronger, lighter, all of those things, right? Then I ask all these moral questions, right? Of yeah. like, is that okay? And like, is that even, I mean, what about the Olympics? Like, would that, like, what does that do for people if they've replaced an arm and now they can throw faster, right? Like, there's all this world of questions that have nothing to do with the, the actual physicality of pulling it off, but it makes you wonder, like, about this super human race that could be created by replacing a lot of our functional parts with things that are better, faster, stronger, all the above, right? But aside from it even going there, I feel like I want you to tie it back to the apple at the beginning of the and the teeth. And so I don't know if it's possible to allude to all the moral questions that this might bring up without having to go deeply into it. Because we don't have to answer that. We just have to get people thinking, right? And, and maybe tying it somehow back to the teeth somehow. Because that's where we started. And I'm not sure what that direct link is yet. But that to me would feel, so you start with, uh, the apple is very central and the teeth are a very central part of the story. And then we sort of go forward, but I forget why we started there at the end. And I'm wondering, maybe you guys have a clever way to tie it back to that concept. But I feel a little unsatisfied leaving that like apple at the front and not going back at all. Um, maybe if you added at the end that, you know, not just in the future scientists that will do that, but they're already kind of doing that with braces, and then goes back to the teeth. There you go. Right, and just bring it back to the idea that, you know, they're doing all these crazy things. Think about your arms, your legs, or your nose, or whatever piece of your body that you might want to trade out, upgrade. But every day, people around you are doing that with their teeth, and we take it for granted. Just something that, just a quick tie back to that. Um, also, and that kind of goes along with the goat thing. Um, would the fact that these implants work better um, kind of make people want to replace the bones in their body? Just, oh, I want stronger arm bones or something like that. So I think in, for me, that's another question that I had. You know, what are the implications of these implants for you know, our society? Like, are they, right now, are they prohibitively expensive? Are they. Um, I mean, you don't have to. You don't have to go totally out there, but I think you're right. And as an audience member, you're wondering, like, oh, I love running. Maybe I could run faster if I just traded my legs for different ones, right? Like, why couldn't I do that? Are we ten years away from that? Are we ten thousand years away from being able to do that? No. The only thing is, I'm worried that this is opening up a huge can of worms at the end of your video. So maybe a quick way to sort of gloss over it. Maybe this is a little cheap, but. What I would 
what I would do if I were trying to fix or rework some of the ending. And endings are so hard to write. I, I don't know if you guys have experienced this before, but I've always found an end, like the ending to be the hardest part to write in the script. But what if you went, um, your jaw isn't the only place where these osteoclasts and osteoblasts alter your bone structure. In fact, this bony remodeling process is happening throughout your entire body. And where braces use osteoblasts to physically move things that are already in our bodies, and my, or <coughs> engineers um, use the properties of these cells to replace things in our bodies. Um, now the idea of building ourselves as bionicle people and replacing our bones with stronger ones may sound so like something out of a science fiction book, but when you think about it, that's what the things that you know most teenagers have to use do as well. Um, yeah. Then yeah. add an yeah. ending sentence yeah. that I can't think of right now, crunch into your apple. You know, so that way you've kind of reduced. Yeah, that's what we need. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't yeah. need to be long, but it needs to tie that con those, two, those concepts. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah. And I can talk to you more about it afterwards because I can't ad lib a <laughs> great script impromptu. But um, that way you're sort of condensing all this down because I, I really love the example of the implants but I want your focus of the video to be on braces, basically. Um, so that way you're just sort of hinting at it and then tying it back to the beginning with the apple. Do you, I mean, people know that if, you, if, you, if your braces come off and you don't wear your retainers, they go right back. Which, which I just wonder if someone who's listening to this is like, well, if you follow Andrea's logic, my, my, my teeth have like permanently put, like rebuilt their cellular structure in this new space. Why would I need to do that? Okay. Why would you? Like, if if I if I understood what you're sharing in this from a like cellular level, what's actually going on? I shouldn't have to wear a retainer because my, my my cells have like things have ground together and like there's a change that's actually happened in my mouth. That's not just the movement, but it's, it's like physically changing my mouth, right? So why why should I have to wear a retainer if my mouth is actually changed because of my braces? Can you just add a line in there after you say that the uh, PDL cushion gets back into its proper shape? And then um, having a retainer make, because bone remodeling and rebuilding happens constantly. I think that's the one fact that isn't in there um, that might be the crucial point here that even after you get braces, your osteoclasts and osteoblasts are continually remodeling your jaw. That a retainer makes sure that the osteoblast and class reformation is happening in the right place. Yeah. You can just throw in a quick sentence there or a quick afterthought to that sentence, and I think that clarifies that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think another thing. Um, to point out is that your the your descriptions of the science that goes behind it um, don't seem very heavy. So if you wanted to add more um, science, maybe I think that would be okay in this video. Um, at least that I wasn't distracted by the science that was there. So I yeah. feel like if if necessary to kind of add more about the PDL, but that could be. I had a lot more about the PDL and I yeah. ended up cutting it out. I mean, the reason why I suggested you take some of the stuff about the PDL out is because the video was really starting to seem more about the PDL and less about bone remodeling. Um, so I agree that the way you've worded things, it is, it's not too jargony. So if you wanted to add more about remodeling and rebuilding and more about the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts. Um, maybe how that bone remodeling happens to you in your leg bones all the time when you grow. Um, I think that's a perfectly nice place for that addition. If you want to make room for it, I, I do think that, what is it? The mechanoreceptors part, it's a neat a neat thing that I'm okay with having in there, but if you need to make room for more science about the osteoblasts and osteoclasts, I think it's okay to take out too. 
But I would hesitate to talk more about the PDL because then you're really getting into a different type of video, which if that's what you want to pursue, that's totally fine. Um, but I think to me, the video is really more about bone remodeling than it is about the periodontal ligament. So that's my only hesitation with adding more facts about the PDL. Sound good? All right, any last thoughts about Andrea's? No? All right, Paul, do you want to go next? Or PJ? Paul is actually a PJ, as yeah. I discovered last week at the end of class. My parents told me the other day, too, that I didn't have the first name for the first three days I was born, so. Was you formally PJ? No, formally Paul. But since I was three days old, I was born, so. But everyone called you PJ? Uh, it's, it's 50-50. Okay, so why didn't we know this sooner? I yeah, this was my reaction last week too at the oh end of God. class. Um, oh yeah, the doc is gone. <coughs> Siri's updating it, I, okay. or Siri. Sorry, I don't know why I keep doing <laughs> Wait, so your parents knew that you were going to be a PJ? They just no, didn't know? No, they didn't know what my name was. Oh, OK. Yeah. <coughs> it's amazing how many people do that. Did they, did they know you were going to be a boy? Uh, no. Could have been Paula G. Is it up now? Refresh. Why is it not? Oh, yeah, it's still showing up blank for me. I'm pasting it in, but. Do you mind reading it from your Google Doc while sure. Sarah figures that out? Uh. All right, laptop's down. And remember, read it like you would host it. Sure. Right. Let's take this small foam box, Orca 1, and cut a hole in it. Now, let's put this box in the water and see what happens. As you can see, the box unfortunately sinks due to the weight of the added water. Now, what if that box contained cargo or oil or even people? That would make for a very bad day. <coughs> Now let's take Orca 2 and do the same thing. You can see that Orca 2 did not sink, although it was sitting at an angle. So why did Orca 2 not sink? As easy as it sounds, this simple demonstration is essential to the design of huge, complex ships. Ships that are responsible for safely transporting 90% of all our stuff. As naval architects, how do we design ships carrying our stuff to make it into port safely and not sink? Well, let's take a look inside. Here we have Orca 1 and Orca 2 from before. Even though these boxes do not engage in international trade, they behave just as a thousand foot steel cargo ship would. If we remove the tops of the boxes and take a look inside, we see that Orca 2 is divided into compartments by these walls <coughs> called transverse bulkheads, while Orca 1 is not. These compartments are watertight, meaning even if damage, I didn't say meaning, so these compartments are watertight. Even if damage occurs in this part of the ship, water rushing in won't go into other compartments because the damage is isolated. We refer to Orca 2 as being subdivided. It is unclear when subdivision started being used in boat building, but accounts of Chinese trade ships as far back as the 5th century indicate that water would enter ships without sinking. So how exactly does this work? Well, when we divide the ship into watertight compartments, we are limiting the amount of water that can enter the vessel. If we, if we divide a ship into 10 equal watertight compartments and one compartment sprung a leak, only that compartment would take on water. This would likely cause the ship to heal and trim, but it would not cause a complete loss of ship and cargo, and the ship would be able to hobble back into port and get repairs. 
But why is it so important, you might be asking? Because ships are huge, and they carry a ton of stuff. A ship the size of more than fo four football fields can carry 750 million bananas. That is about one for every European. Also, U.S. takes in almost $2 trillion worth of goods every year through ships. So by subdividing ships, we're ensuring the safe delivery of our stuff and the health of international world trade. But sadly, even with subdivision, vessels still can sink. It is both expensive and impractical to design a ship that can withstand any amount of damage, so naval architects consider the likelihood of damage in writing <coughs> ship design regulations. Also, the use of computers in naval architecture allows us to simulate likely damage scenarios so we can better prevent them from happening. So the next time you use your cell phone or eat a banana, remember the amount of engineering that went into safely delivering it to you. Done. You are good on time. This is about four minutes to deliver. It's up now? All right, so you guys should be able to access the script now. Does anyone have thoughts about this off the bat? PJ slash Paul. You, there, are mo there have been moments in class when I feel like your personality has come out and I've seen your like eyes sparkle and your voice light. Like, there's this, like, I feel like there's two versions of you. There's probably serious Coast Guard man and there's like the person, <laughs> right? And I, I, and I think the thing that we need to like make sure we tap into is like not super serious okay. Coast Guard man in this because when you read that just now, I was like, he's talking like this and I'm kind of bored. That was me inflecting. Okay. <laughs> Remember, you have to but exaggerate like, in front of the camera. Not, like, you're smiling, you're dynamic, your voice is alive. Like, I know it's in there because I've seen it. And yeah. when we talked about giving fifth graders pornography, it was definitely there. Yeah. So, <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> it's a story, I'll tell you. I got it, I got it. Um, teaching faux pas that I had back in the day. But um, so, like, I know that that personality in you is totally there, regardless mm -hmm. of the content. I feel like you need to like find a zen way to ch channel that part of you in whatever video content you do because there is something innately very fascinating about this, right? The content's really cool, the fact that you like have this really awesome experience that none of us have and I totally think is amazing. But if you gave it the way that you gave it right now, you would kill this, right? So we've got to figure out how to like get that that energy in, in your in okay. your being. To I, give I agree with you. So what was your two line what was your two line summary of this whole So my initial one was wasn't that great, but like it's pretty much taking something simple that people know how to do. Or like floating and sinking and how there's a lot of um, complex things that are designed and built that carry a lot of really important things that we depend on based off very elementary uh, like principles. I will show you your two sentence pitch. Yes. It feels a lot like a document. What do you mean by that? Uh, kind of like the, the image I get like kind of walking through a museum. Uh, you know this what is the, tell us what, what it is. So it's, it's about subdivisions, uh, subdivision in ships. So if you take something that floats, like a shoebox, yeah. and you put a hole in it, it'll sink. Right. But if you divide that shoebox into, you know, watertight sections, you know, this one compartment might not cause it to, to sink. And how we've advanced to, you know, the, the time where a ship can be extensively damaged and still stay, stay afloat and people won't die. Uh, what? So, sort of like the first little section that you gave about it, it's almost like I'd like you to say that and then say, "Hey, we can we can just do this experiment experiment live right now. They need to just like, do this right yeah. now. Yeah, let's take this. And here's a small phone box that I've decided to call work alone. Right. You know. Yeah. Okay. And I think, again, I, I mean, the showing not telling is really hard to script when you haven't actually worked with the video stuff that much. Yeah. And maybe as you shoot, you'll realize, oh, I don't actually need to say, as you can see, I can right. just say, the box sinks. Um, and you don't need to say, uh, 
you don't put any contractions in your script, which I think is interesting. Um, and when you deliver the lines, you're not going to say do not. You're just going to say it doesn't sink. Um, I say less right there. Oh, okay. So One apostrophe. Like, but I love doing this. You're probably going to ad lib based on what happens. Right. Just to be like right. the, the crazy Russian hacker guy. Right. That, that right. Yeah. And that's what gives it kind of your personality will come out as this is happening. Sure. So. so, with the introduction, I was. So, I. Uh, Elizabeth and Sari's comments kind of allude to, you know, there's got to be some sort of like, uh, just to know what we're talking about here. So I did that, and then that turned out to be bad. It was a bad introduction. Um, so then George said, you know, just get right into it. Just get right into the, the box and how this. So I'm kind of confused about what, well, like. What you just said was perfect. With. We all know that some things sink and some things float. Right? But it's actually not that simple. And, and this, this fairly rudimentary concept is something okay. that naval architects use every day. So wait, wait, but that, wa that was the original. Let me, do you mind if I pull up the Google Doc that you had sent sure. me before? Um, I just felt like it started really abruptly. Sure. And you yeah. needed like just a little, okay. a little, a little bit. Yeah, even just having like a mock Navy ship like smashed and then watching it sink and float. Because like what you're talking about is the gray zone in between sinking and floating, right? right? right. Yeah. And we want us to, to get in that gray zone quickly with you. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I like that you're starting right away. Like I know that we had talked about sort of, uh, Josh had mentioned that during his workshop, like just start in the action. Um, but I think that you're, Intro itself is visually and visually interesting enough and topically foreign enough to most people, to where like that itself is a bit of a hook too. Um, and by setup, we don't mean like an entire paragraph. I think like that one sentence is fine, okay. actually. Um, and when you guys shoot, I I really challenge you guys not to use a script, which sounds terrifying. And oftentimes that'll just mean like, okay, what, what line do I have to say here? Like, I'm gonna say this line, and you put down your script and you deliver it ad lib. But it's gonna come out so much more natural that way. When you talk in real life, you, uh, you turn your head a lot, which is like, that's what makes you seem like a human <laughs> versus, versus like a humanoid. <laughs> um, not saying that the delivery was this time, but uh, there are a lot of things that people do naturally that, that they don't realize. And so I think it's fun to point it out to people because when you're um, shooting in front of a camera, it's very hard to remember those things. It's really hard to be natural in front of a camera, basically. Um, but like all of you guys were saying, or some of you guys were saying, like I'm not good in front of the camera. And I watched some of the raw footage from class, and you guys are all great. And it's technically in front of a camera, right? Uh, <laughs> so you're just not looking and not aware of it. So it's somehow like being able to extrapolate how you are in this classroom and carrying that over to when there's a camera right in front of your face. Um, and I do think that it's the little things, like sometimes you tilt your head, sometimes you look off and not directly in front of the camera. Blinking is a big thing. I don't know if I mentioned that in earlier classes, um, but if you look at your footage and you're like, I seem off and I don't know why. I feel like my voice is fine. I feel like my pacing is fine. Try to notice how many times you blink. A lot of times people will keep their eyes open <laughs> for a really long period of time and they don't blink where it makes sense in their speech. And so they're just talking like this. Who does this when he gives presentations, it's totally creepy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so. Um, like, Dude, you have to blink. Like. <laughs> Blinking, at head tilts, looking off to the side like you would normally. Um, those are all like little techniques that you can think about when you're hosting. Um, and it's, it's sort of counterintuitive to force yourself to be natural, but sometimes that's what you have to do. I really recommend, if you haven't already, I think most of you have already, but for your reflections, think about doing a vlog, because vlogging is like the basest form of video creation <laughs> in that you like literally stare at your computer. And if, if you want to like get comfortable with the idea of a camera, you can like set up your camera as though you were recording yourself for your video or something like that. And just talk into it because we're we have no expectations for your daily ref reflections. You can be like, 
I, I was really scared going into class today, and then you can stop thinking, and you can look off camera, and you can say, um, and we won't judge you at all. And it gives a good reference point for when you do have a polished video. It's like, do I have even some of the quirks that I showed in my blog, do I even have yeah. some things like that? Yeah. And it just like gets you more, com I don't know, I was really uncomfortable in front of the camera, and I still kind of am, but vlogging, and doing that process and seeing how, oh, if I make a mistake, like forgetting what I'm gonna say and I can just like cut that out and seal it together, it really gets you a lot more comfortable with just like seeing your face on a screen, which is a really foreign experience for people. Yeah. I think the overall format of the script is, is pretty strong. I don't think you need to change a whole lot in terms of the format. Um, adding the, a little bit of context at the beginning would help. Um, stuff like this sentence though, like, I don't think you would ever say these two sentences in real life in your speech, right? Well, I, that's why I said, I think while he's doing it, you're yeah. going to be ad-libbing. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And again, like, you don't have to script out. It's OK if you deviate from the script a little bit when you actually deliver your lines. Um, but this sentence, that would make for a very bad day, or the one that at the end of your video, you know, um, that's why we can't enjoy, or decomposition is awesome, right? You don't necessarily have to say that out loud to people. They're just going to kind of know already. Um, the one comment I wanted to make was that the context, uh, I think introducing a little bit of context at the beginning will help with this issue. Because right now, without it, this jump seems really huge all of a sudden. Um, talking about sinking and then talking about like economy and money all of a sudden. I don't know if any of you guys felt that way too. But it seems a little like, oh man, first we were talking about cardboard boxes. Like Now we're talking about trillions of dollars. And I, I think it's a good point to make because you do want to take people out to the bigger context. Um, yeah, but it's it's a little it's a little abrupt. Um, and instead of saying, but sadly, even with this subdivision, I think you can set this up as a question. Like, so we have this subdivision. Why do ships still sink? Yeah. <coughs> and last comment, and then I actually have to hit the road. But if any of you didn't get feedback from me and you want it, because I know it can be a little early, um, just email me, and I my my MIT address is not the one that grants me access to Google Docs. So if you want, just email me, I'll give you my Gmail account so that I can actually read it. Um, the, naval, the naval ship is such a cool thread throughout this that I don't, I don't think you necessarily, like if you can use the cardboard box as Navy ships, Mm -hmm. yeah. And not have them just be abstract cardboard boxes, right? Yeah. And if the cargo ship carrying bananas is carrying military personnel, like you don't have to go outside of that genre in order for this to be a really cool video. In fact, I think it's cooler if you stick with the military theme okay. because that's something that's actually, especially to the middle school bullet boys who like blowing up things, like that's even more authentically cool than bananas, right? Yeah. And plus, I mean, if you can even make Orca the box look a little bit like. I made him. You made him? <laughs> but like, if, even if you just right, put right. a moon and put some put stars it. on them, <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> it doesn't have to be crazy fancy to right. still get the idea that this is like sure. a Navy ship, right? But I think that if that Navy, Navy theme comes throughout the whole thing, then, then it's like you're, that, that, that becomes a really cool okay. theme. Yeah, I uh, I gotta run. I'm gonna miss my train. But you guys are awesome. Email me if you need anything tonight. Okay. Uh, kind of going on with that. Um, when the football fields and bananas were introduced, um, that was kind of taking me out of the video, and uh, making me think of monkeys. Um, and then at the end, also like you were mentioning cell phones and bananas, but you never mentioned cell phones before that. Um, so I do like the idea of kind of keeping with the military theme. Um, also some of the, um, there was a part where you had two questions, a question at the end of the paragraph and that was for two consecutive paragraphs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the right here. Yeah. Um, so those were kind That's of a good point. Like
taking out of the video. Um, but other than that, I really enjoyed the content and uh, like this is very different from the original draft. Um, but like I would very much enjoy watching this video at this point. Originally you had talked about like Archimedes principle and buoyancy, but I think this is a lot stronger because you're actually getting into why the compartment itself. Okay. So I'll just like pretty much fix those questions and then like take out the whole like the merchant marine type thing like yeah I think the point that you're trying to make with those examples is basically like just the sheer importance of right. making sure your ships stay afloat right. and I think you can do that with other examples okay. that are a little more unified to the theme okay. um, I will say that uh, this stuff at the end like this sentence right here uh, no this portion right here. Um, if you want to expand on that a little bit, I, I think it would be interesting because it's more of like a, a current event engineering problem. And again, like that makes the video more unique than a typical engineering textbook, right? You're talking about like, what are the actual problems that I myself as a naval architect um, am dealing with? And you can talk about the uh, I don't think you need an also right here because this is really a continuation of this explanation. Like, mm -hmm. ships sink because they're expensive to design. Um, so you have you have like trade-offs in the the engineering of it. But you know we use computers to simulate the damage, so we know exactly how to subdivide them and um, what the best way to design those subdivisions are. And then instead of this sentence, um, I mean this point is a little bit different than the point that you were intending, which is that um, like very simple principles are what allow like huge, seemingly complicated machines to, to work. So if maybe you can somehow revisit that point at the end instead of this sentence. I think that would end a lot stronger. So is, is your advice generally to drop the whole cargo ship? That wasn't even in there. I added all that. Like yeah. it was, it was more like I'd say, like the equations and stuff like yeah, that. There was the, the draft that he sent us, and um, there was a big part about Archimedes' principle and buoyancy, which again is super informative, very accurate. Like, is the type of material that they're going to learn in school, but isn't necessarily vital to. Yeah. This is more of an engineering video than it is a physics video, and I think that's very valuable because um, there's actually. <coughs> I'm looking at um, simple demonstration is essential to the design of huge, complex ships, ships that are responsible for safely transporting 90% of all of our stuff. Yeah. Wait, where is it? It says new angle way up the top. Yeah. Oh. I mean, I, I kind of thought it, the container ships are sort of a theme in the entire thing. Yeah, no, I don't think cargo is, I'm not saying get rid of the cargo stuff at all. Okay. Uh, because, I mean, that's, that's what I really, that's my bread and butter is, like, yeah. merchant ships and not... Yeah, no, then that's... So I'm not, uh, not really in the Navy. So. Well, but, but, and then the tie-in with the cell phone thing is that safely transporting 90% of all of your, our stuff. Yeah. If you take a, like, a zoom in on a cell phone and flip it over and it says made in China, that's sort of like, how did this get? Yeah. That's what in I was trying to get. China into my hand. I think... I don't think that you should get rid of the, the cargo stuff okay. completely. Sorry if it sounds like we're doing, like having competing opinions. Um, I think the thing that throws us off is um, the connections to the examples you make aren't necessarily immediate. So I hear four, four football fields can carry 750 million bananas. Like, wait, why is he talking about bananas all of a sudden? Oh. I should just say like how, how yeah, I, I, I got it. I'll, I'll try to revisit that. Um, and maybe it's as simple as just adding a single sentence, like right here, about yeah. they carry a ton of stuff, 
um, a, a lot of products that we have to import from other places, um, things like bananas. And a ship the size of this can carry 750 million bananas, you know. So it just sets up the example a little bit more clearly, if that makes sense. Uh, any other thoughts for PJ? So I think that we're at a good stopping point here. I don't want to hold you guys over today. Um, so we have Kenneth and Joshua left, right? So tomorrow we will finish up the table reads with their stuff, and then I'm going to give my final talk on post-production. So this is everything from editing to music to thinking about what you do with the footage that you take. We'll also tell you tomorrow what groups you're going to film in. Was anyone planning on filming stuff tonight? No? Um, that's fine. Just like use tonight to rework your scripts. Um, as far as deliverables and assignments, I think really reworking your scripts tonight and tomorrow should be the main focus. So I'm not going to have anything particularly due. Um, how about all that footage that you shot last week? Um, I'll let you guys tinker around with the editing of that after I give my editing lecture. Does that make sense to people? So for tonight, rework your scripts. Um, and for people who haven't gone, I mean, Kenneth and Joshua, if you want to update stuff based off of the things we've talked about today, that's fine. And you can just send Sari an update. Um, make sure to do your daily blogs, though. That'll be really helpful. Um, and then just come to class ready tomorrow to finish up the two reads and then do some editing. Does that sound good? Um, the first cut of your video is going to be due this Friday. Do you think that is feasible and reasonable? So this would be like the first draft of your video, basically. Like you'd have to film everything for it this week. Do we have, is there a day where we're submitting um, like, the sh like the shots? Like the, the, the shot list, yeah. yeah. Um, I can, I would like to see that uh, by Wednesday, if possible. But that's really more for your benefit over mine. Um, and Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday will be in class work days. So Friday's the screening. What oh. I could do, so this weekend is a three day weekend. We don't have class next Monday. If it would help people to use that weekend to film more, I could have the rough cuts do, or we could screen the rough cuts on Tuesday instead of Friday. Would that help people? Yep. Uh, my question is. Uh, I guess, what are like the things you generally would do between a rough cut and a final cut that would like? Um, so, I will I'll talk about a little bit of that tomorrow. I'll actually show you the rough cuts of our old videos. But a rough cut um, takes all the footage that you've shot and puts it together into a draft that doesn't have music um, and may be missing some scenes or may be missing or may require reshoots of scenes. So usually what happens between a rough cut and the final cut, in addition to music and maybe better editing, is you almost always end up reshooting something because it doesn't look that good in the context of all your other footage. So the only reason why I had a rough cut due so early is because I wanted to leave you guys enough time to reshoot if you needed to. But if it's going to be too much work to get the rough cut in place in the first place, I'd rather you like really try to get as good of a rough cut as you can than try to rush one together. Um, not necessarily, no. So if it, are we on consensus? You guys want rough cut due on Tuesday instead of Friday? Because that totally works for me. Basically after tomorrow and aside from the screening of the rough cut, every other day of class is work time for the projects. And that next week is Tuesday, Wednesday, or Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? Because doesn't the class end? What, like? The class ends, so today is the 12th. The class ends at Thursday? Yeah, the class ends at Thursday, which is the, like, I, it was sort of optimizing, like, leaving enough time to get the rough cut, but also leaving enough time to give, give you time for reshoots. Um, 
our screening is the evening of the 22nd. Yeah. And then what happens the last week of IEP? So the last week of IEP, um, we'll pick scripts to produce for season three of Science Out Loud. And if you guys are interested and if it fits into the casting, then we would produce your video, basically. Yeah. Sorry to the SUTD guys, so you'd have to go back. Yeah. You could stay another week. Um, so that's why we end so early is because you guys have to go back and then we're producing season three in parallel. So that's all I have. I'll, I'll make the rough cut due Tuesday. If you finish stuff before Tuesday and want me to look over it, I'm happy to do so. Because um, I know that the turnaround is insanely quick for this. Um, and I know that we're cramming a ton of stuff into these three weeks. Do we need to meet up with our groups to over the weekend then? Um, no, and Tomorrow, we're, we were going to hand out assignments for who your groups would be. Um, if you can shoot stuff on your own, like B-roll, feel free to do that. Like, you don't have to just use class time to work. If it's more convenient for you to just catch some stuff on your own, do a tripod selfie type shot, go ahead and do that. Um, but no, you don't, you don't have to just only work in class. Everyone has their own camera and their own equipment, right? Okay, yeah. So tomorrow we'll do editing, finish the table reads. You'll have the rest of the week to work. We will screen rough cuts on Tuesday the 20th then. But that means that you won't get feedback from your peers until Tuesday the 20th. Is that okay? So basically your rough cuts are gonna be so good that you're not gonna have to reshoot anything. No, I'm just kidding. Um, it'll be fine. How good does our video need to be, like, in terms of the visuals? I mean, I, I totally understand that you have, like, a week to do this, basically. So if you can't, you know, do a full-fledged animation, you can't fully realize those things, like, I completely understand that. Um, this is going to sound stupid, but just try your best. Because <laughs> uh, that's why um, creating the rubric for this class was really hard, actually, because like I knew that all these constraints were here. And so I couldn't like raw scale points, like 10 points if it's lit correctly, right? Because that's just like unreasonable. Um, but I, what I really want is the intent to be there, um, the thoughtfulness, the understanding and self-awareness of like maybe what's lacking, what you'd like to develop further. If you can't film, like if a, a film location falls through at the last minute and you can't film there, <coughs> stuff happens, I totally understand. If you can just like maybe write what you wanted to do instead, that's totally fine. But, uh, same thing with animation. It's like, I'm sure some of you have like very, or like especially with the fractals, like zooming in on fractals, that's a difficult animation to accomplish, especially if you haven't done animation before. Think of using still images because it's really easy to overlay a still image or even something that you draw yourself and we're just kind of like, I don't know, yeah. like what Science Out Loud videos do as opposed to making this really complex, like multiple moving pieces. The more moving pieces you have, the more, the harder it's gonna be able to do um, Whatever, it, the harder it's going to be to do. Faster. We will be around during class every day. So if people want specific help, like Sari's done some animations herself too. So we can help you with that stuff if you have specific questions. But shoot for the best you can. Definitely don't be like, well, I'm going to leave this out because I'm just going to justify to Elizabeth later that I couldn't get it. Um, try to do the best you can. But I understand the constraints that you're working under for sure. Um, so don't stress out about that. And feel free to email us because some things like after Elizabeth's editing lecture, there might be something like you're in the editing program and it might take you like three or four hours to figure out where this tool is and how to do this one thing. Like my audio disappeared, what? Um, but if you bring it to one of us, chances are we've encountered it before and can like fix it in a couple minutes. Hopefully. Sari's probably a lot better at that than I am, just to be honest. <laughs> 
All right, does that sound okay to everyone? I do apologize for the quick turnaround. I just, I know it's a lot to cram into three weeks, so I understand the limitations that we're working with. All right, well, I'll stick around after class if people want to talk about their scripts more um, or have other questions, but you guys are free to go. I'll see you tomorrow.